okay, we're live. We're ready to start. We're ready? Yep. Shall I? Yep. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Martin Braddock, uh, who is conducting this presentation live from the UK. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and a fellow of the Royal Society of Astronomy. He has been a leader in drug development for respiratory and immunological clinical studies and therapies, and a noted STEM ambassador for science and engineering. His topic tonight addresses the challenges of human physiology and space travel. Dr. Braddock, we welcome you. Thank you very much, John, and, and thank you everybody for the kind invitation. Let me just share my screen and make sure everything is up and running, which it should be. And then we'll, we'll take it from there. So can everybody see that okay? I think so, yep. Okay, so uh, I've called this uh, presentation, the challenges for long space journeys and the need for space medicine. And it's particularly with a view to thinking about the history of space medicine, uh, what we may see on the horizon, what the space environment can do for us for the future, and then some more futuristic looks at potential uh, applications of space medicine uh, for us on Earth. So I thought as a way of an outline, I'd, I'd take us through the uh, travel safety record uh, for space, history of medicines used in space, give everybody a little bit of a, a crash course in drug discovery and, and drug development. Um, describe some effects of microgravity on, on the human body um, and the effects of radiation. And then ask the questions, where, where can or where could uh, space help us with crystallization studies, uh, regenerative medicine, the potential for human enhancement, uh, thinking more futuristically, and then synthetic biology, and, and then summarize it. So just by way of thinking of, of, of learning points, if this is of any help to, to you, I thought let's, let's think about defining what medicines are used in space today and what have been used in the past. Go through what the stages of drug discovery and drug development are, what's unique about microgravity and how it can help us with drug discovery and drug development. And then take a look at uh, what drug studies have been conducted in space and then think really quite futuristically, what may the future hold for, for counteracting the effects of, of the space environment? So to start off with, this, this slide is the total summary, at least of what's in the public domain, of the major effects that have happened uh, in space. Now, of course, that doesn't include um, some of the uh, um, unfortunate and, and cataclysmic events that we've witnessed with uh, spacecraft taking off uh, and spacecraft coming into land. Uh, but nevertheless, when we look at the number of adverse events or serious adverse events that have happened within space, there have been very, very few. So probably the best recorded life-threatening event uh, was in the 1960s, middle 1960s, uh, in the Voxhod uh, mission when um, an astronaut who uh, left the uh, spacecraft uh, and conducted his extra vehicular activity um, had his uh, space suit inflated so much that he couldn't get back into the spacecraft. And there had to be some manual air bleed, uh, which effectively led to him developing a, a mild form of the bends, which could have been, of course, life-threatening. Um, it wasn't, um, and he made a full recovery. But that's the only incidence or the only major incidence um, that's in the public domain. There have been a number of other um, relatively minor events, all of which have been managed, thanks, of course, to, to mission planners and the contingency uh, of planning. So by and large, the space uh, record or the safety record in space is very good, at least, um, at least so far in the short term. 
So if we think just a little bit about what, what medicines have been used in space in the past, and some of these may be familiar to you, some of them they uh, may not be, they, they fall into a number of classes. So a number of stimulants such as epinephrine, uh, dextroamphetamine, uh, anti-emetics uh, for motion sickness, uh, of which cyclozine and tegan uh, have been historically used, number of analgesics or painkillers, um, and acetaminophen or paracetamol, I guess, is, is very familiar to all of us. Some anti-resorptives have been uh, used, uh, which is to stop the effects of bone loss. And we'll talk quite a lot about that a little bit later. Uh, and these have been uh, bisphosphonates and uh, aledronate. Uh, and if anybody has osteoporosis on the line or knows anybody, um, they're more or less uh, bound to be taking one of these agents. And then there's a whole number of other uh, agents, um, such as sedatives, uh, decongestants, <laughs> anti-defecants, um, because uh, one of the common events when astronauts return back to Earth, of course, is that their, their, uh, um, their bowels um, start to fill. Um, and, uh, and of course, that wouldn't be good publicity for astronauts coming out of spacecraft when they land back on Earth. Uh, decongestants, anticoagulants, and antiarrhythmics. So if we think back to the very early years, 1961 to 1963, I, I find this quite, quite fascinating. Just three main medicines were carried on those missions. Uh, uh, an anti-motion sickness drug, a stimulant, uh, and a vasoconstrictor for the, for the treatment of shock. And that was it. That was the total arsenal of space medicine in those days. In the Gemini missions in the middle 1960s, got a little bit more advanced with, with 10 new medicines in the, in the medicine chest uh, for common illnesses, uh, such as um, congestion of the uh, respiratory tract, uh, diarrhea, fever, pain, and, and motion sickness. But again, not, not exactly a, a drugstore uh, for astronauts in those missions. Move a little bit further, and then, of course, as we move into the Apollo era and the Skylab mission era, now we're starting to get more sophisticated. So a whole bunch of uh, medicines that are, again, catering for many of the conditions that I've described previously, but now starting to think, at least in the Skylab missions, of the possibilities of needing to manage wound care, dental care, minor surgery, for example. And uh, most, if not all, of the astronauts that are on the International Space Station are actually trained to be able to extract tooth should it, should it be necessary. If we think now to the uh, 1980s and uh, on the International Space Station itself, we're now really into the era, era as, as we would expect of much more sophistication. Uh, medications and bandages, bioinstruments, electrode attachments. Uh, of course, everything is now monitored, as, as you might expect, uh, quite rigorously. And within the ISS, there are a whole bunch of now uh, standard operating procedures put in place, countermeasures um, to uh, try and nullify the effects of microgravity. And I'll describe some of those um, in a moment. And then uh, an advanced uh, health uh, maintenance system. And if you take it all together, just look at the, the column on the right hand side, there's now 60 medications. In fact, it's over 60 medications satisfying uh, around about 20 um, symptoms, uh, which may be acute or even chronic. And those uh, medications may be administered via viral routes as on Earth. So there's no, um, now no disadvantage in terms of how you can get given a medicine uh, on the International Space Station. So what I'd like to do is just illustrate just a, a few things. Um, and uh, there, there's a two papers in particular that I'd like to mention, both of which have been uh, published by uh, Rebecca Blue. Um, and uh, the first one is describing the limitations in predicting radiation-induced pharmaceutical instability. So what does that mean when, when it's at home? Well, if, if we've got a headache and we go to a, a Walmart or a Boots the Chemist in the UK, we buy our Advil or our ibuprofen, um, it's going to be good for two to three years. And that's fine for missions on the International Space Station. 
But if we're thinking about longer term travel, uh, maybe missions to Mars, uh, colonizing Mars, maybe, and then coming back again, there is a good chance that the active pharmaceutical ingredient in your, your favorite painkiller won't be active uh, by the time you, you need it, simply because that uh, active pharmaceutical uh, ingredient decays or degrades over time. And there's been quite a lot of work now conducted uh, principally in the US, but also in Europe, showing that that uh, active pharmaceutical in ingredient can decay uh, faster in the, in the presence of um, uh, en uh, enhanced levels of radiation found in space. So mission planners have got to think about not only how they get drugs that have a shelf life that is long enough to support long-term travel, uh, but they also need to think about how they can protect them from the effects of space radiation. And there's been a number of publications uh, over the last uh, two or three years, and uh, we've had a couple through uh, Sherwood Observatory, uh, particularly thinking about how we could use the space environment to develop new drugs for the future. So what I thought I'd do, just to help orientate us a little, is, is describe the drug discovery and drug development process. And apologies if you're very familiar with this, but um, I think it's quite useful. So up on the left-hand side, to start off with, um, this is where we, we have our concept, we have an idea. We, we've thought of something that we want to do, whether or not it's to attack uh, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and we're starting to think about what drug targets to direct our, our drugs to. And this often uh, takes between two to five years. There are, of course, exceptions. Um, it will often involve a very, very large number of molecules, potential medicines, and then to, to help us make a, a choice about how good those potential candidates are, we'll think about crystallizing the protein uh, that we want to target the drug against. We'll think about what's called structural-based drug design, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. We'll think about pathway analyses, uh, some of the omics work that can be done, and we'll also think about drug stability and active pharmaceutical ingredient duration studies. That'll get us to a point uh, when we've done our safety studies in a non-clinical environment where we'll enter uh, into human clinical trials. And that takes on average between six to eight years to go from phase one to phase three. We'll submit our new drug application. Uh, we'll hopefully have it approved and then we'll have it uh, in the wider world of people, you or I, uh, for whatever ailment uh, we've developed the drug for. And the typical process can take anywhere between, um, I guess, two to 10 years. On average, uh, for each new drug, the ballpark figure is about $1.5 billion to uh, develop uh, and launch a new drug from start to finish. And of course, there are exceptions. And the exceptions that we're all very, very familiar with are the, the COVID vaccines. And when you hear, uh, as, as we do in the media, uh, people say, well, the COVID vaccines can't possibly be safe because they've been developed so quickly. Um, that, that's completely untrue um, because we don't do the preclinical stage for COVID vaccines. We know what we want to target. Um, we know how quickly the process can run uh, when we've got a system that can produce vaccines in the way that it's doing. So everything that is being done for the vaccine work actually is exactly the same as this. It's just that we're able to, to cut out various steps because we're in a much more knowledgeable position about uh, uh, how we want to be able to target the vaccine. So where, where can spaces help us uh, when we think about this drug discovery and drug development uh, process? To my mind, it can help us at, at either end, but not in the middle. And I'll explain that in, in, in a little bit. So when we think about trying to identify new targets for space medicine, all of the type of non-clinical work is perfect for a microgravity environment. And there have been a, a huge number of very, very valuable studies that I'll illustrate um, in a little while. If we then think about 
the far end. So let's just imagine we have now all of our drugs developed on Earth for all of the ailments that we know, and I'll talk about uh, uh, osteoporosis in a moment. We know those drugs are safe. They've been in millions of patients on Earth. So why would we not want to use those drugs in astronauts who are experiencing bone loss? There's no reason why we wouldn't. So the uh, application of drugs that have been approved on Earth for astronauts in space um, is, is a clear, uh, clear way forward for accelerating drug development uh, and the possibilities of introducing new medicines. The part where space can't help us is in actually testing drugs in people. Because today, I think it's just over 600 people have been in space over 50 years, over or, or over just over 50 years. And when we think about the numbers of patients or the numbers of volunteers that are normally included in clinical trials, it's many hundreds, if not thousands. So the actual possibility of being able to do um, a conventional drug clinical trial in space, to my mind, is very, very limited, simply because there aren't the numbers of people um, at any one time to be able to do it. But that doesn't uh, certainly uh, preclude the possibilities uh, of uh, doing uh, studies at the, both the early and the late stage of drug development. So some of the effects of uh, microgravity on the human body are, are listed here. And I think we're probably all very familiar with the effects of muscle strength and bone density decreasing. And I guess we're, at least from what I can see, we're all probably old enough to remember the uh, Apollo missions um, and uh, some of the later missions when you, know, you would not see astronauts walk away from the mission that they would returned from uh, because they couldn't. They were actually physically unable to do it. And they're physically unable to do it because uh, they've either um, lost enough muscle, muscle strength or bone density um, to be un unsteady and unable to walk, um, or they've experienced um, uh, space motion sickness um, or a neurovestibular dysfunction, which means they've lost coordination, that they physically can't walk away. And if you've ever uh, read Scott Kelly's book, Endurance, uh, after he spent a year on the International Space Station. Um, it, it certainly pulls no punches, uh, the effect that microgravity had on his body uh, while he was uh, on the ISS for, for a year. There are a number of other features. Um, the uh, fluid uh, redistributes from the lower extremities uh, to the upper body and to the head. And if you imagine uh, two or three liters of fluid redistributing from the lower body to the upper body, that, that's quite a, a shift in body fluid. And of course, all astronauts are effectively uh, ultra fit athletes. So perhaps for you and I, uh, redistributing two or three liters from our lower body to our upper body might not be a huge issue. Uh, for people who are extremely fit uh, and lean athletes, you can imagine that, that, uh, that that's quite problem problematic. And there are a number of other effects as well, such as the increase in renal stone risk um, and uh, uh, an increase in the negative calcium balance. So what I wanted to mention was uh, probably one of the most popular areas that's been explored is the effect of bone loss. So astronauts typically lose uh, one to one and a half percent of bone tissue per month. And the loss of bone density uh, over a three to six month stint uh, in space uh, can take anywhere between two to three years uh, to regain back on Earth. And I've taken some data here uh, where the, uh, the change from pre-flight uh, bone mass has been plotted uh, for astronauts in space flight over a six month period. And you can see consistent with the figures on the left, um, there's around about six, six to seven, maybe um, seven and a half uh, percent uh, bone loss. If you compare that with the downward trajectory, uh, that's fairly typical for postmenopausal women that lose bone mass, as we all know, 
um, they can lose round about 10 to 12 percent over over a three year period. So the question that mission planners are trying to grapple with now is let's just imagine we're on our way to Mars, uh, we're thinking about a three year mission in total. What, what's the trajectory of bone loss going to look like? Um, is it simply going to follow uh, this type of trajectory and maybe flatten out? Um, or, or could it possibly follow just a linear trajectory downwards? And just imagine losing 25% of your bone mass um, should that uh, pattern follow. 25% of your bone mass, and of course, it's not just arms and legs, uh, but it's the rib cage, um, the sternum that supports the uh, the lungs to allow us to breathe, um, the pelvis, the skull, uh, the digits. 25% bone loss would really be quite dramatic. So what are the countermeasures? And the countermeasures are, are exercise uh, and lots of it. Um, and again, if you're familiar with some of the devices that are on the International Space Station. One of them here is called the Advanced Resistance Exercise Device. Um, and it's effectively a, a, a weight system um, where astronauts can mimic the effects of, of deadlifts. And this particular one here, uh, Kiel Ingren, is, is demonstrating this, um, as you can see in the photo on the right. Of course, the best things to, to try and help um, bone loss uh, is, uh, other than exercise, of course, is, is loading, but also good nutrition. Um, and astronauts now are, are um, given a very high quality food, high quality protein that's monitored uh, and tracked uh, very rigorously. They're also given bisphosphonates, um, same as uh, patients with osteoporosis receive on Earth to prevent, uh, prevent bone loss. And if you're not familiar with a, a bone section, the upper panel um, is a bone section from a person who's got a normal bone uh, who isn't osteoporotic. Uh, and the bone section on the bottom panel there is from a patient with osteoporosis. And you can see there's more of a honeycomb structure uh, in the bottom panel than there is in the top panel. And that, of course, will at some point result in that bone becoming more brittle and, and susceptible to fracture. So one of the, this is the, only, actually, I'd say one of the studies, this is the only study that I can find that's in the public domain um, that looks at the effects of bisphosphonates as a supplement um, to exercise to prevent um, bone loss. And apologies that the figures are a little bit blurry, but actually that's how they are in the, in the publication. So on the bottom panel here, these are different bones. So the spine, pelvis, total hip, trochanter is the part of the uh, top of the femur in the hip. And of course, this is the neck muscle. So arid is the advanced resistance exercise device I showed you on, on the other slide. So pre doing any exercises with arid, this is the spread of, of, of bone mass change uh, from pre-flight. When astronauts uh, do their exercises on the ARID machine, uh, you can see that the uh, percentage change from pre-flight is reduced. So this is having a positive effect on, on their bone mass, exactly, of course, as, as mission planners expected. And then if you add on top of that bisphosphonates to stop the bone loss uh, as an anti-osteoporotic, anti um, you can see that there's some very nice increase uh, there all increase in loss of bone mass or less of a loss of the bone mass, less of a change uh, from pre-flight values. So taken together, this, this is a very nice illustration of where the combination of exercise on the resistance device together with an anti-osteoporotic uh, anti agent um, can attenuate the decline um, in, in all indices of bone loss um, subjected um, uh, during space flight. So a very nice illustration of how space medicine can, can help us. Now, of course, not, not everybody um, is able to respond to bisphosphonates in the same way that not everybody responds to uh, medicines on Earth. So there's been a lot of work conducted uh, in non-clinical species um, in animals in space uh, and Amgen uh, hit the news uh, in 2015 
when they started to develop a new um, anti-osteoporotic uh, agent, uh, and this is called osteoprotegrin, um, shown to be a very effective countermeasure for space flight induced bone loss in, in mice. And these studies were actually conducted in space. And I put together here the, the literature that we published um, a few years ago that again shows that this is the total repertoire of new agents um, that have been developed uh, and are being developed uh, to try and counteract the effect of bone loss uh, and muscle loss. So osteoprotegrin, I've mentioned, Amgen also have um, two other antibodies uh, that uh, can protect against the loss of uh, lean muscle mass. Uh, there's another agent that can protect against the loss of uh, muscle mass. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, there's a one here that uh, can protect against the loss of muscle mass that I'll tell you about in a moment. So th th this, this is quite interesting because although this is being put forward as a potential way of reducing the loss of muscle mass for astronauts in space, this has huge applications for people on Earth because of course there are many muscular conditions where muscle mass is lost. Um, and there are a whole number of neurological diseases uh, and uh, some muscle cancers uh, where muscle mass is lost. So anything that can reduce the loss of muscle doesn't just have application for astronauts, it has application for, for many, many people on earth. And, uh, just to get us all up to date, um, these are some of the publications, some of the recent publications uh, from a number of labs around the world uh, that show just how, um, just how intense uh, scientists are working on uh, trying to find ways, new ways of blocking muscle mass uh, loss and uh, bone loss. Now I put this um, example in because this is something that's very close to my heart. Uh, Formoterol, if you're not familiar with it, is a what's called a long-acting beta agonist. Um, if you have asthma, uh, you are almost certainly taking a long-acting beta agonist. And I, the reason that this grabbed my attention, why I thought this was quite exciting, is that it, it starts to sow the seed of delivering uh, medicines in a reservoir. And the reason that that interests me is that it's, it's using nanotechnology and nanofluidics to implant, uh, ultimately, the aim would be to implant in people a very slow release mechanism um, that could uh, uh, effectively reduce their loss of muscle mass. Now, the studies that have been conducted are on the right-hand side, um, and these are in animals, and these are looking at the effect of space flight versus ground control. And in all cases here, there is an increase in the weight of the, of the muscle. Um, so this is the gastrocnemius, this is the TA muscle, this is the weight of the quadriceps, uh, this is the grip strength, and actually this is just measuring the concentration of the drug in the animals. So this is quite interesting because not only does it show that it has a positive effect on, on muscle mass in, in mouse studies, there are many patients on earth that lose muscle as a consequence, uh, for example, of, of smoking induced diseases, chronic bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, and it, it's quite possible that this drug may be able to help them in addition to be, being useful uh, to combat muscle loss in astronauts. So where can space help us when we start to think about crystallization? And there's been some absolutely super work uh, conducted by NASA over the years, um, looking at the possibility of, of using microgravity to form better crystals. And I'll show you why forming better crystals is important in a moment. On the top right-hand corner, it is what we call a ribbon diagram of a protein. So if you imagine that, our, let's just imagine that our protein here, this bit in the middle is actually what we call the active site. And let's just imagine that it's that active site that we want to be able to block. And we want to be able to block that active site because we want to turn off an enzyme, let's say for example, um, that is driving a, a cancerous process. Now to be able to get this ribbon diagram, 
Um, what we do normally is conduct X-ray diffraction studies. And to, to conduct X-ray diffraction studies, we need to have good crystals. And good crystals, of course, can be hard to come by. Um, and I was around in the 19, uh, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. I worked in the HIV uh, area uh, and the reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme, which is crucial uh, for maintenance of uh, human in, immunodeficiency virus, um, was, the, was the, the biggest target for drug discovery and drug development of, of that time. And one of the things that held it up was not being able to get good crystals. Um, and the Wellcome organization was so desperate to be able to do this uh, that it managed to get crystals up on the space shuttle at the time. Of course, the International Space Station wasn't around then. Uh, and they did manage to form some crystals. And I'll show you those um, in a moment. So on the bottom, this is some um, insulin. And you can see here on the right hand side, these are crystals of insulin formed on Earth, and these are crystals of insulin uh, formed in space. And they're not only larger, uh, but they're actually better structured. And if you look at the crystals on the right hand side here, they're more irregular. So if you're blasting your X rays at these crystals and you're wanting to be able to get a good structure, um, you would quite easily be able to get a good structure from these crystals, but you'd probably really struggle with those. So what, why, what, what, what's the big deal about using microgravity? Uh, and actually this, this nice little illustration, and it is a simple illustration, I think explains it to us. So on earth, um, we, 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 we generally have, of course, the, um, uh, the presence of gravity, which makes things quite irregular. In space where there's microgravity, there is a much more gentle and ordered um, coalescence of the individual parts of the protein that allow us to make the crystals. And it's really as simple as that. There's, there's, there's a little bit more to it, but actually if you imagine that the microgravity environment allows a much more um, controlled, slower three-dimensional assembly, um, that's the main reason why we're able to get better crystals in space. And I mentioned uh, that there are a number of studies that have been conducted. This was the one by the Wellcome Foundation on reverse transcriptase. There's been a number of others, uh, Keytruda, um, a key drug for the uh, treatment of cancer uh, by Merck, greatly benefited from work um, that was conducted on the International Space Station, as did anti-alpha uh, interferon. Um, that has been uh, shown to have uh, uh, efficacy in a uh, number of cancers and also immunological conditions. And there is some further work that's being, um, that's being conducted as we speak. Uh, and it's, it was conducted a while ago and the results are still awaited publication. So even though these studies were conducted uh, six, seven years ago, um, we're still waiting for the results to be published. So growing crystals in space can help produce better structures. And if we have better structures, we're better able um, to carry out rational design. And that rational design can help us produce medicines faster. And this is the example of the key Truda work that was conducted. Uh, and there is now a very dedicated, um, extremely professional uh, uh, access to be able to uh, grow crystals on the International Space Station if you want to. And actually, this is a wonderful picture. This is actually the, the miniature lab um, that's used on the International Space Station. Um, and you can see it in the middle there, pictured wonderfully within this um, cupola uh, window uh, on the ISS. So when we think back now to our, our space medicine, what are some of the limitations that we have? And, and what we don't know is how do medicines behave in the body? So PK stands for pharmacokinetics and PD stands for pharmacodynamics. What we don't know is do drugs behave in the human body in the same way as they do on earth? There are very few studies that have been conducted. Are drugs excreted normally as they are on earth? So whenever we take a drug, um, the drug gets broken down and we excrete it. Um, is that mechanism the same in space? Do we get some unfavorable drug accumulation? 
um, could drug dependency result. So again, if we're thinking about long-term space missions, these, these questions are pretty crucial. So how do we answer these questions to start off with? And as I started explaining at the start, how do we manage a decline in active pharmaceutical ingredient that would effectively over long periods of time make drugs useless? And to some extent, um, surgical interventions may well be conducted remotely from Earth. But of course, we have a signal latency period um, wherever we are in space. And certainly uh, we would have if we were on Mars. Um, and telemedicine is now uh, beginning to be more practiced in Earth, or on Earth and may well uh, extend to space. But again, um, would you put your hands uh, in, a, in a remote telemedicine type procedure if it was life threatening? I think the answer is probably not. So there'll have to be some way to be able to combat that for the future. So I wanted to mention a little bit about radiation. Um, and if you're not familiar with the, the dose of radiation uh, or the units of radiation, the millisievert, um, don't worry about it. Uh, but about 100 of them um, is where the uh, incidence of cancer is more likely. Most of us will be living in an environment where we'll experience around about two millisieverts. If we work in or live near a nuclear power station, we're, we're up at about 20 millisieverts. If we're on the International Space Station, um, then we are receiving twice the dose uh, for which the incidence of cancer is more likely. Now, more likely doesn't mean it's going to happen, uh, but nevertheless, we're at elevated risk. And then if we ever get into interplanetary space, we're, we're well outside uh, the recommended levels. So that started to pose a little bit of a problem, of course, for, for mission planners and certainly thinking about going to Mars. So. I've summarized here, this looks a little bit complicated, but, but it isn't really. The part that matters, let's just say we're going to Mars. Now let's, let's be a little pessimistic here and say that Mars receives around about 100 times the radiation received by, by Earth. Mission planners uh, have already worked out what the lifetime exposure of radiation would be for any astronaut. It's different between uh, men and women. Um, and it actually gets greater as you get older. And this puzzled me the first time I saw this the, a few years ago, and I started to work through it and I asked a few people, I said, well, why does the lifetime tolerated dose increase as you get older? And the answer is very simple. The answer is simply because you've got less long to live. And uh, when you think about that, that, I guess that makes sense. But for most astronauts who are probably going to be in their uh, certainly in their 30s, maybe their 40s, when you think about astronauts suitable for colonization, um, that perhaps doesn't give them all that uh, much of a window to play with when you consider that the lifetime exposure of radiation is exceeded by traveling to Mars, staying on it and coming back again. So this poses a real problem for, for mission planets. Um, it's how do we manage the effects of radiation not just traveling to Mars, but staying on it and then um, either staying on it permanently or coming back to Earth. And there was a wonderful paper published now three years ago, and it's um, taken a group of international scientists um, and it's coordinated through the NASA AIM Center. And it started to put together now a, a radiation uh, management roadmap, uh, predominantly trying to understand what are the mechanisms of radio resistance? And could we harness them in some way? And when you think about the application for that, it's not just about understanding what might make human beings less susceptible to radiation. Um, it's, it's the converse of that too, which is why do, for example, some tumors uh, not respond to, to radiotherapy? And if we can understand the mechanisms by which tumors can become resistant to radiotherapy, we may be able to not only help patients um, who have to have radiotherapy, uh, but also perhaps think of ways to exploit that biology uh, to protect astronauts in future. And I put these two little beasties up. And again, if you're familiar with extremophiles, I'm sure you've seen these before. Uh, but the, the one up at the top left is Dinococcus radiodurans. It's a bacteria. 
If you're not familiar with the gray, again, it doesn't matter. It's a radiation dose. Five to 10 will kill us. Uh, but this bacteria is quite happy to withstand 15,000 gray. And actually, it doesn't just withstand it, it, it will grow perfectly well in it. The tardy grade at the bottom, um, which um, is uh, pretty much a, an example of an extremophile that can with, withstand uh, virtually any extreme condition, um, can withstand 5,000 grade. And a number of groups, uh, principally uh, the uh, Kudieda group in, in Japan, um, uh, have isolated uh, what they have found to be a protein that enables the uh, resistance to radiation of, of the tardigrades. And they've called it damage suppressor. And if you look at this little panel on the right hand side, you can see in human cells that have been irradiated with, with four uh, gray of radiation, um, the total cell number starts to decline. Uh, but when they've introduced this damage suppressor protein, not only does it not decline, but actually the cell number increases. And all the damage suppressor protein does is it allows a very, very fast repair of the DNA within these microorganisms. So it doesn't put some sort of little protective shield around the bacterium or anything fancy like that. It simply allows the damage to the DNA that's been done by the radiation to be repaired very quickly. So just think of the potential application that that could have for the, for the future. So I put this um, slide in because this is uh, quite a hot area. Um, this has actually been developed by a company called 3D Bioprinting uh, Solutions in, in Moscow. And they conducted the first bioprinting uh, experiment on the International Space Station. So we're probably all familiar with 3D printing uh, and maybe even have 3D printers. But in this particular case, the, the bio ink, if you like, is, is human cells. And what uh, these uh, uh, folks have done is they've now started to make very primitive cartilage structures and very primitive thyroid glands. And so they've used chondrocytes here on the left and thyrocytes on the right hand side. And the intention is to forward think into the future. Could the space environment and the lack of gravity, which allows the assembly of an organoid to come together, could it ever be used? And this is very futuristic, but could it ever be used to, to manufacture organs in space for human transplantation? And it might sound a little bit wacky today, but I think in five, 10 years time, we'll certainly see validation of this technology on a small scale. And it may well be that the microgravity environment does start uh, to enable the production of some very primitive organs or organoids. So I want to finish up with just a little bit of a whistle stop tour on, on human enhancement and, and synthetic biology. And this does get a little bit now futuristic, but actually I think the future is coming much faster than, uh, than we think. So I guess the questions are, is it, is it realistic? Um, is it advisable? Uh, is it ethical? Uh, and is it essential? So when you think about human enhancements, and I talk to some of my non-astronomy friends, um, they automatically think of Terminator 3s wandering around the planet. Um, and of course, it's uh, not, a, not a, an unpleasant thought if you're a science fiction fan. Uh, but nevertheless, re reality is that we're, I think, a very, very long way from having that type of enhancement available. Human enhancements in the simplest term have been around for a very, very long time. Um, so the, the very idea that, that spectacles or glasses are human enhancements, well, you, you know how long they've been around. They've been around certainly, as far as I'm aware, uh, for at least 800 years in a, in a primitive form. And of course, much more advanced today than they were even 10 or 20 years ago. And there are a whole bunch of other enhancements uh, that uh, we take for granted. Uh, which, of course, can include um, organ replacement. Uh, it can include wearable devices, um, sports devices. Uh, it can include a whole range of uh, prosthetic limbs uh, now and covers for prosthetic limbs that are so lifelike, at least from a distance, they're very hard to tell. 
uh, that they're not uh, that they're not real flesh and blood. And then, of course, they can include a whole number of sensory aids uh, that include cochlear implants now uh, and uh, even um, uh, brain computer interfaces in a, in a relatively primitive form, uh, but still good enough to allow communication uh, for people who, uh, who have lost it. So then you start to think a little bit about, well, if we're thinking about human enhancements at the DNA level, what, what, what could be coming up for the future? And that there are three principal ways that we could change the DNA of an individual. We can give the DNA um, as a gene therapy. And I started off in my scientific career working in gene therapy um, in the uh, middle 1990s. And actually, unfortunately, it was ahead of its time. It really wasn't taken that seriously. Now there are a number of gene therapy products. There are hundreds of clinical trials uh, being conducted around the world. And gene therapy has benefited patients enormously with rare conditions. So the pros and cons of gene therapy uh, are, are much more in favor of the pros than, uh, than the cons than they were 20 years ago. Then get into the area of thinking about editing DNA uh, or gene, gene editing as it's called. And there are a number of ways to do this. There are two ways to do this. One is somatic gene editing, which is just editing the DNA of the person uh, that has a particular condition. And of course, this is conducted um, in some ex to some extent um, in patients who have life-threatening conditions. Uh, and there's one particular study that's eagerly awaited at the moment uh, in patients who have a, a rare uh, genetic um, disease of the eye, which ultimately will um, make them go blind. So somatic gene editing is one area. The one that's much more controversial is, is germline gene editing. So if you edit uh, the genes in the germline, that effectively means that you don't just change the person, but you change the person's offspring. And you would induce that permanent change um, such that uh, their offspring uh, may also uh, inherit that change too. And I was trying to think through, well, what are the conditions that would allow that to happen? So if we were thinking about futuristically, as has been proposed by Max Tegmark, um, uh, there have been a number of other futurists that have proposed this, Sir Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal uh, in the UK. What, what conditions in space would possibly induce healthy people to have their DNA modified. And it may be that this is um, the pioneering spirit that some astronauts may want to um, engage with. It may be perhaps that uh, in a case of real existential threat to humankind on Earth, that there's almost nothing to lose. But I think the idea of gene editing, um, perhaps for space travel for the future is a long way off, but I think it's much closer to home uh, on Earth uh, for patients with rare diseases. And I think there are now in total over 20 gene editing studies, uh, somatic gene editing studies uh, that are being conducted in patients on Earth. So it's something to think about for the future. And it is really to get uh, to drive enhancement. This summarizes a little bit about um, the potential for human enhancements for the future that could perhaps uh, make individuals less susceptible to radiation. It could make individuals uh, less susceptible to immune mediated diseases. Uh, also uh, help individuals perhaps lose less bone and less, less, um, less muscle. Perhaps also increase lifespan's longevity. Uh, and there are some potential targets that might do that. And I've summarized these on, on this in this table. So when you think about this as science fiction, actually it, it's not science fiction. Achieving it right now is science fiction, but there are a whole number of potential molecular targets that have been identified that may come under the banner of radio protection, prevention of hard tissue loss, uh, reduced demand for oxygen. And this is quite a, sounds a little facetious, but it's well known that in the Korean population, 
there is a genetic mutation that reduces body odor produ production. So these people still sweat, but they don't produce body odor. And again, if you were thinking about the design of a colony for the future in a very confined environment, would you want to select people who had this genetic mutation? It sounds quite a trivial thing, I know, but is it possible perhaps to think about how we might forward select uh, colonists for the future on the basis of their genetics? And I mentioned life extension. There are a whole range of geroprotectors, as they've been called, uh, that may again uh, be uh, possible targets for human enhancement for the future. So this ABC11 uh, gene uh, in particular, um, very, very strongly implicated in the South Korean population uh, as being uh, a protector of uh, body odor production. So what might, might the future hold? So we're going to summarize in about the next five minutes now. What might the future hold? I, I, I think for me, protein crystallization and structural based drug design is one way that we'll find new medicines for space, uh, just as we will on Earth. The advantage of the microgravity environment to allow good crystals to be formed gives us a real um, head start on uh, the potential to find new structures, faster ways of directing drug discovery and drug development. Identifying new targets and showing that they're valid uh, by some of the non-clinical studies that I've described, I think is also something that will have moderate and significant impact for the future. The two areas that I see as being really important and having major significance are being able to understand drug stability and active pharmaceutical ingredients, and also thinking about the potential of 3D bioprinting and tissue regeneration. To me, those are, those are areas that are happening right now. Uh, NASA, has always, uh, uh, NASA has also funded uh, 3D bioprinting studies uh, on the International Space Station. And I wouldn't mind betting that in five to 10 years time, we will start to see um, some primitive organs produced on the International Space Station as a consequence of the 3D bioprinting. Mentioned that I think the uh, possibilities of actually conducting clinical trials um, in space are, are actually negligible simply because we don't have the numbers of people to be able to enter those trials. But the, the possibilities of taking drugs on Earth, um, extending their indications by um, expanding their post-marketing uh, studies um, in astronauts in space. I think that's uh, very, very likely as you've seen with the bisphosphonates and also the possibility of um, developing machine-based learning uh, algorithms and telemedicine. I think again, being driven by the advances on earth is just a surefire way uh, into helping us develop new medicines in space. So what made the future hold? And this is another area that I, I think is, is moving at pace. And this is the area of synthetic biology. So the bringing together of the fields of biology, systems biology, biotechnology, engineering and manufacturing and safety assessment is now starting to engineer drugs from extremophiles uh, that we wouldn't have thought of five to 10 years ago. And if you're ever interested in hearing a little bit more about this, um, this is something that's very close to my heart and I'd love to come back and, and tell you. So just in summary, what, what could the future hold for, for space medicine? I think discovery of new drug targets and application of uh, terrestrial approved medicines, um, that, that's happening now. Development of tissue engineering systems as, as medicines of the future, um, I think that will happen over the next five to 10 years. The potential for human enhancement um, will be driven by the terrestrial need. It's not something that I see as being a target for space, but it will happen. I think it's a, it's a logical consequence of gene editing studies. And the development and deployment of device connectivities. Um, and again, if, um, if you work in this area, you'll know um, just how important that industry is. 
um, certainly in the health sector, where I think that leads into the potential for synthetic biology uh, applications for the future. So hopefully <clears throat> what I've done, if I've done my job well, um, is I've shown you uh, what medicines have been used in space and uh, given a, a potted history um, over the years. Given a very big crash course in drug discovery and, and drug development, um, shown you about what's unique about microgravity um, and how it can help drug discovery and development uh, of drugs on earth primarily, which could have um, collateral benefit uh, for astronauts in space. I uh, mentioned just a little bit about what drug uh, studies have been conducted in space, and then also thinking for the future, what it could hold uh, for counteracting the effects of the, of the space environment. And there I will finish. I, I love this photo. I, mean, I, I could never tire of looking at photos of the moon. Even more impressive that this was 50 years ago. So thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I have a few questions. One of, well, is there a great deal of collaboration between the Russian and the US program in terms of space medicine? Or is it just done through journal? I think it's, it's, I think there's an element of competition, that's for sure. But I think there is more collaboration now than there has been in the past, um, simply because there just aren't the facilities to, uh, to be territorial. So there has to be collaboration and there has to be the best use of the facilities that there are available. Um, and uh, it's, it'll be interesting when the International Space Station gets decommissioned, what, what will happen then? Because there has to be a replacement. There has to be a lab in space. Yes. In, um, you know, I, <clears throat> you've, um, I've, I've heard that the living quarters aboard the space station can be quite pungent. So perhaps work on the ABC uh, <laughs> 11 gene would be, uh, would be quite valuable. But I, I do have one last question. Uh, some months ago, there was quite a bit of mention in the media about what they dubbed space brain. Have you heard this? Oh, okay. And I wasn't quite clear what it is, but they've said that it could become a major obstacle in, uh, in space travel. I think it, it's in part um, the effects on coordination, but also the effect on the um, um, what's called neuroplasticity, which is the ability, I think, over the long term to think coherently. And, and I think it's when you start to lose perception and you start to lose judgment and it's whether or not that becomes irreversible. So the, the, there are a whole bunch of studies that, again, are, are conducted in, in non-clinicals, in animals or in very simple organisms. And, and they, look, they, look, they could look a little bit depressing because they start to um, illustrate how uh, the neural network starts to decrease. Mm -hmm. so the neurons that start to make up the brain, at least in these primitive organisms, they lose the branching structure. And the implication is that that means that the, the signaling in the neurons will start to decrease. Mm -hmm. And if that was to apply to human beings, of course, then that, that would lead to a, um, a loss of ability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it refers to. I see. Okay. So it's, it's a little worrying. And I, I talk to a, um, a lot of my friends that have worked in some of the terrestrial analog studies um, that have been conducted for the moon and for Mars and for in submariners and in folks in the uh, Arctic, um, uh, some of the Arctic surveys. And uh, I said to them, you know, what do you think about uh, the idea that something that could reduce body odor may be beneficial? Is it just, <laughs> is it just amusing to you? And they said, you know, one of the things that irritates people the most in a confined area is bad body odor. And they said anything that could reduce that um, would help keep morale up when people are in very close to confines. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, so, so it's a start it, there is, you know, there, there is something to it, and um, and uh, and I think if 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 you imagine being in an environment where there is there is no safe way out, because you're stuck with each other, <laughs> uh, I, I can imagine something like that could be almost the tipping point between keeping something structured and having uh, some sort of dispute that might lead to might lead to admission failure. So I think it's that's that serious, something like that, that I could see being quite a quite a problem for mission planners to work through if it goes wrong. Yes. Are there any other questions? Um, uh, nothing actually, posted on just to let you know, nothing's posted on uh, uh YouTube in the chat. So uh, we have no questions. I, I had one question I didn't realize I, I didn't think of putting on chat. Um I know that when Scott Kelly was in the space station, they did yep. Yep. studies because he has a twin brother who's also an astronaut. That's uh, right. Comparing yep. the two of them. Yep. Can you talk about, I haven't read his book, although it's on my bucket list. What experiments, what um, did they learn? Yeah, sure. So, so, so this is NASA's Kelly twins experiment um, where, uh, uh, Matt, Matt was on Earth and Scott was on the ISS, as, as you say, um, and they took just about every sample that's possible to take from both Scott and, and Matt. And lo and behold, of course, they found a lot of differences and they found a lot of differences that you might expect from uh, two people being in wildly different environments. What they did find that was interesting was that certain uh, measurements didn't go back to normal even after Scott returned to Earth. And there, there was a lot of interesting publicity because what was published by the, uh, uh, by shall we say the less scientific media was that Scott's DNA had changed. And he actually went on, uh, on TV in the, in the US and said, I didn't know my DNA had changed. Where does all this come from? And of course, it, it, his DNA hadn't changed. What had changed was the expression of genes in his DNA. Um, and to some extent, um, the one that I think is probably the most significant is the, the telomeres at the end of the chromosomes, which dictate our aging process, were affected differently in space than they were on Earth. And to my knowledge, those, um, those telomere shortenings haven't returned to normal when Scott's returned back to Earth. So it's quite possible that there may be some short-term effects that we could expect from anybody who's been in an extreme environment. But there may be some longer-term effects that we're still yet to discover from having been in space. In one of the, if you haven't read the book, I won't tell you what's in it. I don't want you. We don't want to spoil the story, but he doesn't pull. No, any don't punches. tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't pull any punches about um, what he thinks uh, about how NASA manage astronaut health in space, uh, and it, it's it's a real eye opener. Really, I really recommend it. Um, it's light reading to start off with, uh, but actually, it's very very. Um, eye-opening uh, and also uh, it goes through what he had to manage when he came back to earth and even as a seasoned astronaut he found it tough hmm. have there been astronauts which uh, mysteriously never required the medications that the others have um, I, it's a good question, but I, I don't think so. I think every astronaut, as far as I'm aware, has had to have some form of medication. So I think it's, it's around about 50% of astronauts uh, experience motion sickness, uh, even though, of course, they've gone through all the training beforehand. Um, uh, how many is it? I think it's about 25% um, experience visual disturbance, some of which never comes back after they've returned to Earth. Oh, gosh. Um, so it's quite well known that the optic nerve can be inflamed um, in the eyeball, and it's simply because the eyeball doesn't maintain its spherical shape. So it's a consequence of the, the microgravity. The eyeball loses its spherical structure, starts to squash, that inflames the optic nerve. Hmm. 
Mm. So Tim Peake, uh, the UK's claim to fame uh, astronaut, uh, his vision apparently isn't as good as it was um, before he went on the International Space Station. So there, there are, are some uh, effects that I know that are in the public domain, at least, that where astronauts haven't returned to normal. Probably the one that I think would probably have scared me the most was, was Jack Schmidt on Apollo 17 in 1972, I think it was. Um, and he's the only astronaut that we know of to have been allergic to lunar regolith, uh, lunar dust. And he experienced severe hay fever-like symptoms. And can you imagine how scary that must have been in 1972 in the lunar module, um, coming back in after a, a spacewalk, taking off your, your helmet uh, and finding then that you develop um, the classical signs of hay fever. And of course, he, they had antihistamines, I think, in the 1970s. Maybe they didn't. They might not have had antihistamines. Uh, but he would have had... Um, ibuprofen or acetaminophen at, at the time. So that, that must have been fairly scary. But to my knowledge, there hasn't been any, um, there haven't been astronauts that have not had to take anything. And also to my knowledge, there haven't been any emergencies where some form of um, intervention operation has, has had to happen on any of the space missions. I recall that they said that the dust on those early moon uh, landings smelled like spent gunpowder. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Which means that it was in them and they were. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Was, when, when, when you look at what uh, uh, components are in the regolith, I mean, it's pretty much like breathing glass, fine glass particles. So yeah, so 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 quite interesting. But uh, to my knowledge, there's there there isn't anybody who's um, uh, been totally uh, immune to the effects of of microgravity. Ah, okay. Well, I thought that they could be the 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 seed population of a of a of a space yeah space <laughs> colony for the future. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, one of the things you know that that's really. Um, really got me thinking a while ago is that there's a paper published showing that the T cell repertoire, so this is what drives your immune system, mm -hmm. in mice, obviously not in people, but in mice, changes while these mice are in space and their offspring have a different T cell repertoire. And it actually makes sense because in the ISS, it's effectively about a sterile environment as you can get. With the although it's got people in it, of course, yeah. because it doesn't have any environmental challenge. So if you were to, if you were to have a, a little bit of a science fiction thought, and let's just imagine we're going to, off to another world, and we're going to get there in I don't know forty years, one hundred and fifty years, what have you. By the time we've got there, our offspring will have an immune system that's designed for the environment that they've grown up in. Yeah. And it won't be the same as the one that they had from their parents on Earth. So by the time they've got to wherever they're getting to, um, they could be challenged quite severely by whatever um, environment, microorganisms, bacteria, plants, whatever uh, they experience on their new world. So thinking about the immune system is, is again, I think a big challenge for uh, mission planners if it's thinking long-term space missions. So adding to all of the problems of, of people, racism and that sort of thing, we have the potential of, of also having space-bred cultures and earth-bred cultures and, yeah. and just yeah. <laughs> add to the... Yep. So. so got a question here. I thought the space station had, and I can't see the rest of it. Uh, a lot of mold. I wrote it yeah. because you said it was a sterile environment, but I thought I had read somewhere that there's quite a bit of mold. Yeah, well, it, it's a sterile environment insofar that it's it's its own ecosystem. Oh, OK. Yeah, I mean, th that's right. And actually, there's been a number of uh, bacteria found within the space station. No, oh, you're nice. absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's not too good. So, so one of the um, the other thing that's being developed is um, 
um, there is a measure for lung inflammation um, called fractional exhaled nitric oxide or pheno. And it's what we use in asthma studies. So um, your lung inflammatory status is a measure of whether or not you're going to get an asthma attack. And pheno is measured on the International Space Station. And on some occasions, the pheno levels from the astronauts is quite high. So that tells us that there are some things uh, there that are irritating the lungs and it could well be spores or mold. But insofar that it's a closed ecosystem, um, that's what I meant by it was sterile. You, you're absolutely right. It's not sterile, but it, it's within that ecosystem. It's not being continuously challenged as we are on Earth with um, uh, viruses and bacteria. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation tonight. Um, I learned an awful lot and it, it, you know, it gives me hope when I see all this, the research and all these things that are happening. And I just had a little bit of a um, different question. Do we, does the USA have enough young people um, in the pipeline to continue this over the next several decades? Are we yeah. falling behind from a science uh, point of view? I, I don't know whether we're falling behind. I think it's, it's like everything else. It's what captures public opinion to fund it in the first place. And the reason I'm such a strong advocate of using astronomy societies to get involved is because we can help inspire the next generation of people. And we could almost be, if you like, the barometer for, for what we think is acceptable and not acceptable. Um, and, and I just wonder whether public opinion will go against space travel at some time in the future. Um, and I think it's, that's why it's so important with, with the Mars mission at the minute is is keeping it in, in the public eye because, okay, so we've gone to Mars, we've landed on it, we're going to poodle around a bit, now what? You know, what, what happens next? And keeping that interest up for the general public, I think, is so important. Um, and I, I remember seeing an article, and I forget the lady's name now, but she was, she was, um, she was in the high seas um, uh, isolation analog study. And she said, it's, it's very much like you're out of sight, out of mind. So if you imagine we're gonna be on Mars, maybe in 10 years time, be a great scientific achievement, there'll be a big fanfare. And then a month later, two months later, will the general public think, yeah, okay, well, you know, now what? It, it's trying to keep that, that, um, um, that story going and that interest going, because I think that's when, that's then what drives the interest of the next generation. And I think we've all got a, a role to play in that, but uh, I, I, I hope so. I hope we're, that we're maintaining the interest and the funding to be able to, to keep the next generation in, interested. I wish I was 40 years younger or 30 years younger. <laughs> I think we all. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. We could all say that. Yeah, yeah. Ah, well, very good. It was. Uh, I very much enjoyed the uh, presentation this evening. Oh, Learned thank you. And, uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. It was just wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the stream now. Okay. That was great. Thank you. Great presentation. Oh, you're Thanks. welcome.